So thank you again, everybody, for coming. And um, we're just going to give a few minutes for um, a few minutes for everybody to kind of sign on, and then we'll start. We're really, really excited to have uh, Tristan Harris here. He's been uh, super busy, as most of you can guess uh, from uh, the documentary launching. You know, just a couple of weeks ago. I'm guessing almost all of us have seen the documentary. I actually watched it a second time last night with my 18 year old son. Uh, and his friend, um, which was which was really lovely. So if you've seen it yourself, highly, highly recommend you also sitting down if you have kids or have younger people in your life and just watch it with them without a judgment or without anything you're trying to say and then just be curious with them, which was what I did last night. Just like, hey, how did this sit with you? What are the questions you have? How did this, how did this feel for you? Because I'll speak for Tristan <laughs> in the sense if I can that the the part of the purpose of the documentary is to support conversation about this and support yes. dialogue about this and families talking about this. So if you've watched it yourself, as I'm guessing almost all of you have, thank you, thank you, thank you. And if you want to watch it again and invite your partner, your kids, anybody who's living in with, who's quarantined with you now, um, highly recommended. Uh, so it looks like we have almost, yeah, 532 people still kind of slowly trending in. Uh, the plan for today, oh, I'm Soren, by the way, with Wisdom 2.0, Haley's also here. Um, the plan for the day is uh, Tristan and I will kind of uh, have a conversation or ask him various questions for the first 30 or 40 minutes, and then you'll have a chance to ask Tristan questions. So if you have a question to ask, there's a little option here to raise your hand. And so you can click that raise your hand button, and then it'll pop up uh, that you have a question to ask Tristan. I don't know if we'll get to everybody's questions. If there, if there's too many questions, we might not get to everybody's question, but we'll do our best. And please know that if you do ask a question, this is live, both on Zoom and on YouTube. So if you present yourself to the world, please know that it's not you're, you're you 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 will be seen by more people than you might think are seeing you. Uh, so just know that if you do come on camera, that you you will be visible to 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 the world of the internet. Um, so first of all, thank you. Thank you so much for coming. Um, you know, this is something I pinged to Tristan after watching the show. I'm like, wow, this was so powerful. Would you come, you know, for our community, which is really one community. I feel like Tristan and I were talking before, like we're all a part of the same community around mindfulness and wisdom and consciousness and wise use of technology. And so I'm um, really, really grateful, Tristan, for you taking the time to be here. Uh, I know you're super busy and I know you have a lot of things going on in your life. And uh, just a big welcome um, from all of us. It's, it's wonderful <clears throat> really to be here because as Soren and I were just speaking before um, uh, we got on, uh, so much of this conversation for me as a personal journey actually is through the Wisdom 2.0 community. I actually remember the first Wisdom 2.0 that I went to. I don't know if you know this, Soren, but the very first Wisdom 2.0 I went to um, was I think days after that first Google presentation in the film um, went viral within Google. So I was actually, um, this is 2013. And if you know, in the film, when it says, uh, you know, this never before in history had 50 designers in California shaped 2 billion people's thoughts and attention. I think the film came, uh, I mean, excuse me, the, the, my attendance at Wisdom 2.0 was like four days after, uh, that had happened. And so I had met Sherry, Sherry Turkle that year through you, Soren, um, you know, the subsequent years meeting Jack Cornfield, Trudy Goodman, Byron Katie, uh, John Kabat-Zinn, who are all just lovely friends. And I think that community, this community that you are all a part of um, has shaped where this work has come from. So I was actually really excited to do this with, with everyone here and hopefully um, uh, get to take some, some good questions and talk about it some more. Yeah, and I think, you know, there's something beautiful about actually, I know technology has its pros and cons, which we'll talk about, but there's also something sweet about we're all together live and we can see each other's yeah. faces. And so that's kind of how we decided to do it was we want to have at least as close proximity to real life as we can. Um, so I guess I'd start with Tristan with just kind of checking in and seeing how are you doing? Are you, how are, <laughs> this is, must be a huge experience for you. I know when we met, was that six years ago? I don't even know seven, how many years seven ago. years ago I think it's seven it's, years it's, ago you've been committed yeah. to this you were kind of like raising your hand six years ago and maybe five or ten people were paying attention to you and slowly a hundred paying, paying attention to you and now you know I feel like something huge has really happened and I'm just kind of curious how you how you feeling how you doing how, how's your inner world how's your heart <laughs> how's your 
a sense of satisfaction or remorse or, or uh, just kind of, yeah, where's your heart at in this moment, if you don't mind um, sharing? Yeah, well, I, I think I don't mind sharing with this community. Um, just to be transparent with, with many of you um, uh, and the fact that we are all human beings navigating this whole global situation together, but um, I just lost um, our, our family's home in Santa Rosa and the fires that just took place. And so uh, if I seem a little bit subdued or not uh, as sort of um, up as I would like to be, that's um, because uh, that just that has just happened. And, you know, there's this line in the film that what's confusing about this moment, this sort of simultaneous utopia and dystopia. And there's a smaller microcosm version of that because the, um, the film really has been a bigger, I don't wanna say success because we don't really care about success, we care about impact, but it has been so unbelievable, the response that it has gotten. So I can just share some stats. Um, the film was briefly number one in India, <laughs> number two in uh, Canada, sorry, number one in India, number one in Lebanon, number one in Canada, number two in the United States at its peak. Uh, I always joke next to Smurfs too, mm -hmm. um, and uh, uh, which speaks something about how the attention economy works or maybe just that overworked parents are sitting their kids in front of Netflix. Um, when you really think about that, I mean, when we were, and, and thank you everybody in the, in the comments for yeah, I appreciate, appreciate all that. Um, it, it's been really, really hard week, um, you can imagine, but uh, the lessons of impermanence are very present with me right now. Um, but when you really think about, um, when, when we thought about this, this film reaching people and having the impact that it had, you know, it's one thing to do 60 minutes, another thing to get on stage at Wisdom 2.0 and have thousands of people really speak to these issues. Um, it's another thing when you really need the world's attention to understand this was a global threat. So maybe going back in time, I met the filmmaker uh, and director, uh, Jeff Orlowski, who had previously done two climate change films. Um, one of them was called Chasing Ice and Chasing Coral, uh, if you're aware of those climate films. And uh, he and I went to Stanford together. We were actually both Apple campus representatives uh, as you know, 18 year olds and excited about you know, Apple products back back in the day, um, including the third Apple campus rep was actually Jeff Seibert, who's in the film, who's an executive at Twitter talking about how everything you do is carefully monitored and recorded. So um, we had met and in 2017, and this film was about three years in the works. And just so everybody understands, uh, I didn't make the film, I'm not profiting from the film. Uh, it's not, I didn't direct the film or make the film. Um, we were a featured subject in the film. Um, we kind of guided, the core diagnosis that the film follows throughout, um, for those of you who've seen it. Um, and when we spoke about this in 2017, we said, you know, there's a parallel here to climate change, which is that this is kind of an extractive economy where you have an infinite growth economic paradigm, but instead of strip mining the earth down to nothing on a finite substrate of the planet, we have an infinite growth paradigm, but attached to the finite substrate of human minds and attention. And as this community really understands attention <laughs> is kind of the, you know, the, the life blood, the, the sacred thing uh, about, about life. And it's the foundation of presence, uh, it's the foundation of meaning. And um, the, um, uh, so we wanted to tell a story about how this was kind of the climate change of culture built on another extractive economy. You know, we didn't know what we were doing at the beginning. I think the director was not aware of this topic, uh, didn't know our work, didn't know kind of the framing of the problem. And I think that was good because it, he ended up telling a story that was meant to be accessible to the public. What was a movie that you could get everyone to see? Um, the documentary, typically doc documentaries don't get that many people to see it. I mean, in my mind, I compared this to the film, Won't You Be My Neighbor, which was the uh, uh, film about Mr. Rogers. And you know, people pay $11, they go to a theater, you get 100,000 people, 200,000 people, maybe a million people to see a film, and then they go home and have dinner afterwards and hopefully they, uh, they speak about it. So when we were thinking, how would you get a film that's about a global climate change of culture that would be kind of an inconvenient truth, but for the tech industry or a silent spring? And um, you know, we aired the film at Sundance and we originally thought we'd get it into you know, theaters, people would pay $11, have a conversation with their friends afterwards. And it wasn't clear to us that we would get Netflix, uh, even though that seems sort of obvious on retrospect that that would be the biggest way to get that distribution. And then coronavirus hits. And what's really strange is that only in the conditions that coronavirus creates would the film have ever taken the world by storm the way that it has. Um, Netflix had something like 20% more subscribers um, since the beginning of coronavirus because everyone's stuck at home mm -hmm. and they don't have as much to do with their families. And so this film created this unique 
only once in a lifetime kind of global moment of recognition of this problem where in 190 countries and in 30 languages the film was translated into watching it launch and then searching twitter and seeing just this stream of comments we had like five comments per per second for per minute excuse me five comments per minute on on twitter about this you just get this sense that there's this global wave of of consciousness sweeping over the entire internet in every language and in every culture and getting you know um uh, messages from Chile and Indonesia and Argentina, because as much as we care about how these issues affect here, us here in the United States and the election that's coming up, Facebook manages 80 elections around the world. And if you think it's bad here, just wait till you go to places like, I mean, the, the global South, where you don't get nearly the level of election Facebook war rooms and YouTube war rooms that, that they get in terms of protections here. So gosh, there's so much we could talk about. So maybe I'll, I'll hand it back to you, Soren, but just to give people a sense of the global it's, it's almost like a spiritual technology that suddenly the whole world could be made aware of this big thing at the same time, which really could have only happened in 2020 in a pandemic with something like Netflix. Uh, so it's, it's, uh, it's been really, uh, I mean, truly n nothing we could have predicted. Yeah. And I know Tristan, when we met, what was interesting was you were, you were, you had two, I feel like paths when I, when I met you, this one path, but kind of two areas. One was really trying to understand the attention economy and how technology either supports that or doesn't support that. But you also had your own personal journey that you were going on. Cause I know you're doing Byron Katie workshops, you're doing mindfulness things, you're doing. So I'm wondering how did those two, did you feel like those two were very important part of you that you had to go through your own also internal inner world learning that then led to being able to kind of hold what's happening now. Um, so I wonder if you could speak to that. Cause I know that those were very important parts of your life. 100%, I mean, that's, what makes speaking to this community here, um, I think so interesting and important. Uh, I grew so much during during those years. When I first started working on this in 2012 or 13, I didn't have um, a meditation practice. I'd never gone to a meditation retreat. I hadn't done all sorts of workshops that since then I've now kind of done. And um, I don't even wanna say workshops, but just doing the inner work and becoming aware. Uh, and that growth process happened you know, over the years um, was compressed during the weekends of Wisdom 2.0. Um, we met um, my co-founder uh, of the Center for Humane Technology, Randy Fernando, actually at the Wisdom 2.0 Hawaii retreat, believe it or not, mm -hmm. in uh, 2015. We actually disagreed about um, uh, the nature of these problems. And I was getting in a, not in a fight with him, but we were talking <laughs> about it. And um, then later when 60 Minutes hit, um, he he came in and, and we started working together and, and founded the, the organization nonprofit together. But to your point, yeah, I mean, the work and on this topic has been so deeply informed by conversations with this community. I mean, I, I look at the phone and I look at social media in a Byron Katie sense, if you will, as kind of a false belief factory that every time you scroll, it is creating yet another warped perception of reality. And it's really by tuning into these technologies as reality constructing interfaces and everything you could diagnose as being harmful about you know, fake news or, um, you know, the, the psychological issues of technology on the outside, you can actually also do inside of your own mind. You know, we have, um, uh, you know, do we have a negativity bias? So for example, if you have a hundred pieces of feedback and 99 are positive and one is negative, mm -hmm. what does your mind do? Do you, does your mind focus on the 99 that are positive or does it go to the one that's negative? Obviously it goes to the one that's negative. And then it's like, we loop on that as well. So even after you turn off the phone, do you think about the 99? You know, go back to think about the 99 or do you think about the one that's negative? And do you keep looping on that? Knowing about that is a process of mindfulness and understanding how your own mind works that for good reasons, it's very healthy for us to, or important as an evolutionary basis to care about what other people think of us. And um, I've actually had to exercise that recently because you know, as much as there's about 99% positive feedback about the film, there's a few negative ones and you, you sort of notice how this, this whole system is working and everything that's true about the system working on the outside is true about the fake news and virality of bad information on the inside. So it's been just a, we could talk about this for hours, but um, my internal process is 100% um, informs, I think, you know, what we can diagnose about what's wrong with technology is what we can diagnose that's maybe manufactured in our own minds. Yeah. And that's um, maybe that's a follow-up <laughs> documentary or maybe that because it, there is that sense that uh, for me anyways of like human beings like um traumatized human beings create tra traumatized products or tra traumatized things right whole human beings more likely to create whole things 
And yeah. so what, how do we heal as a culture internally and how do we then express that externally? And sometimes the products that we create are a reflection of how divided we feel inside. And so, you know, I'm, I'm curious how you see that. Do you feel like this is a, a defining moment? Like we've defined this moment and now we're ready to step into what the next um, chapter looks like of more humane, holistic, wise technology? Or do you feel like, wh where do you feel like we're at in this progression of understanding ourselves and of understanding how we can use technology in a better way? Well, so there's so many things layered in what you just shared. So one is um, how we use technology in a wiser, better way. And the other is how we create um, technology or systems uh, in a, from a more whole and less traumatized place. Um, so, you know, every way that we are not aware of how our own mind is working and running the show is a place where we are not freely choosing. Like if I'm hijacked by outrage or, you know, anger, um, and I'm acting from a place of certainty because of that, it feels like I'm making a free choice, but the fact that I'm not aware of anger impacting how I'm acting is a, is a dimension that freedom and, and will have, have been reduced into a kind of reaction. If we can't make sense of those distinctions in ourselves, then we can't make technology that distinguishes between a wise and thoughtful conscious choice and um, a reaction. So as an example to ground this for people, you know, um, Facebook's algorithm of the newsfeed, every time you flick, it tries to, it doesn't just show you what the next friend you followed and added to your Facebook feed, you know, posted. It tries to, of the thousands of people that you've followed and the thousands of posts they have, which is the thing I'm going to put in front of you. And it, it shows you that based on obviously what it predicts will get the most engagement. But the, if we don't know the difference between what we want or we'll, we're seeking at a deeper level versus what we'll watch, like if I'm driving down the 101 and if Facebook is running an algorithm that says, whatever I point my attention at is what I want because it doesn't know the difference. Then if I look at a car crash and then it thinks that, oh, he must just want car crashes. We'll give you car crash, car crash, car crash, car crash. So the, the reason I'm bringing this up is when we design technology, the degree to which we're not aware of how we work mm -hmm. is the degree to which the technology is going to be incorrect, incomplete or warping or distorting. Mm -hmm. um, and it's every single place in ourselves that we don't see a part of what's going on is a place where we're introducing a dimension of risk and how the technology will, will misinterpret a signal of, well, I clicked on that, therefore I want it. Because in 2016, the Facebook algorithm um, found this mysterious pattern that anything that included, any Facebook post that included this one, weird, this one weird magic word would always get lots of clicks, lots of shares, and lots of comments. Was that and, <laughs> um, well, you, you want to guess what that word was? It was Trump. Um, oh. No matter what, what article, what post, you know, the Facebook is just this amoral machine. It just says, I'm looking for patterns. And of all these words that people click on, like what are the words that tend to produce the most clicks? And there's this one word that anytime it showed up in a post would always get clicks. And so if you remember back in 2016, every single post in your newsfeed, every single one was Trump, 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 Trump. And, and so he hacked the collective psyche of humanity because the algorithm couldn't make a distinction between something that we wanted versus something that we were lured into instinctively reacting to. And, and that's that race to the bottom of the brainstem, that race into the lizard brain and the reptile brain. And so um, again, in each place that we're not aware of how we work and those distinctions in ourselves, um, that's a place where the technology is gonna be misguided. So I think to answer your question though, I think that the film is really for the first time, I think creating What's been in this, you know, in the Wisdom 2.0 community and other tech reform communities for a long time, this is kind of common knowledge, but I think that for the broader public, this film has, has awakened, awakened, you know, millions and millions of people. We're seeing people come out and try to create brand new social platforms for the first time. And I think for the first time, there are people, you know, regular humans and, and users who actually want to adopt something different than what they have now, because there's a common problem statement. And we all know that there's a problem. And just to say, I mean, there's been heads of state who've seen the film, there's been you know, as leaders of Congress and, uh, you know, leaders all around the world. So it's, I, I think the opportunity to really change things is finally here. Do you think that's like, do you think that's going to change through, through people at some of the largest companies that, that kind of are, are currently where we put our attention, whether that's YouTube or Facebook or Twitter, because they adapt or change? Or do you think that's going to be new services, new platforms will emerge based on different values that will then um, feel like people feel more aligned with those 
things or will it be a combination? How do you see this next chapter moving forward? I think it's definitely going to be both. Um, I think it would be much better, you know, some, one of the jokes we, we've said in the past is, can you turn a duck into a chicken after the DNA has already been baked? Um, and, you know, the current DNA of these technology companies operating on a business model that is all based upon, predicated upon making anything you post, give you the, the promise that anything you post could go viral and then we're gonna create as much engagement as possible. That's the DNA of Facebook and Twitter as an example, and TikTok. It's just instant unchecked virality that does not care nor can it make a, distinguish, a distinction between what's true or what's credible versus what's just popular. Um, the fact that that's so baked into it, now they're gonna make as many changes as they can. Um, and as people have been mentioning in the com uh, comments, I wanna make sure we're clearly diagnosing that our values blind economy that can't make a distinction between GDP based on um, giving people diabetes and then selling them the more profitable subscription plan for a cure versus uh, you know, having a health system that prevents or uh, incentivizes preventing diabetes from happening in the first place. We have an, a values blind economy and capitalist sort of economic logic that is at the root of these problems. And I think the end of the film does say that pretty clearly as Justin Rosenstein, another Wisdom 2.0 member of our community said, so long as a whale is worth more dead than alive and a tree is worth more as you know, two by fours than a tree in this system, you know, now we're the whale, we're the tree, we're worth more when we're addicted, outraged, polarized, narcissistic and disinformed than then we're a human being um, yeah. or a growing child. And so I just wanna name that at the root of it is this economic logic, which means that so long as that economic logic is underneath it all, we are going to have, we're going to be putting patches or someone says band-aids on broken elbows. Like we have a broken elbow, we're putting these smaller band-aids on it. That said, I think we need the help of the existing platforms to do as good a job as they possibly can. Just like we want Exxon to be as helpful as possible in funding as much of the carbon capture as they possibly can. While also we need to like roll down Exxon, you know, and turn it off and, and have these regenerative uh, renewable companies that are really going to take over the future energy economy, be the new foundation of society. So I think we, we need that here too. We want Facebook and YouTube, et cetera, to be as helpful as possible in making the radical changes that we need. But speaking honestly, because I've, we've tried for years to do this advocacy directly with people in the tech industry, hosting backdoor conversations, many of which were actually happening at Wisdom 2.0. There's many people who are at the tech companies who would come to the San Francisco conference and we would have you know, many conversations about what we could change, but it would, we honestly didn't get nearly enough change happening um, as we've needed. And when I look at the growth rate of the harms of addiction, of conspiracy thinking, of crazy town, <laughs> um, compared to the growth rate of product changes, how much has Facebook, YouTube, et cetera, TikTok um, altered their products in, in really fundamentally different and healthier ways, or the growth rate of legislation and, and, and government intervention? We've not seen very much happening there. So as these lines diverge, the thing that can scale to the scope of the challenge is culture, meaning a self-aware um, so, you know, civilization, basically. I say civilization because there's 3 billion people who are trapped in this inhumane uh, logic. And so that's why I think the film is so interesting is it creates an opportunity for a kind of a cultural enlightenment um, or, or as Justin said, it felt like when the film was launched, it felt like the internet became aware of itself. Mm -hmm. That we, we actually gained a kind of civilizational scale self-awareness for what we were inside of as opposed to trapped in the outrage threads and wanting to, um, you know, comment rapidly to make sure the other guy's wrong and, you know, be right and all of that. That's great. It, now, so some, I'm sure you you said that the, 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 um, the film has gotten a lot of praise and then there's also the people who, who have some negative feedback about it. Mm -hmm. um, I've talked to a few of my friends in tech and, and some of them say like, Tristan has some really good points, but he's just too tough on us. <laughs> like, we're good people, you know, we yeah. mean really well. Like when we have right. conversations about this or about that, we actually, um, we actually, you know, have a good heart, we mean well. And I'm curious, how do you view that? I mean, because people will probably go away from watching that and being like, damn, there's some people at, in power that aren't concerned about our well-being and have a pretty negative view of, of certain, you know, of certain people and working at certain companies. How do you, do you see it as like ignorance? Do you see it as, as bad intentions? Do you see it as money oriented? Do you see it as like yeah. unintended consequences? Like, oh, we mean well, but there's these unintended consequences or how do you see that? How do you, how do you see where that kind of challenge is? It's such a great question. Um, we are really careful 
and maybe we weren't always perfect on this in the past, but we've been generally speaking um, pretty careful about um, making a distinction between business models and incentives and shareholder pressure, which are not aligned with society. They are not aligned with our public health. They are not aligned with your kids. They are not aligned with democracy. That is clear. Their incentives are not aligned. But that does not mean that we want to go off and vilify anybody who works at these companies. Um, we, I think when there is what they call gross negligence, where we now become aware of the fact that there is a problem, and then once we're aware of it, we let it continue, um, that's when I think you can make some remarks about there really is a responsibility here. Um, uh, we are now years into a mass societal warping process that has made us into a different kind of species, frankly. I mean, a species that is uh, addicted, distracted, polarized, narcissistic, disinformed, anxious, depressed, unsure of what's true, apathetic. These are a set of effects that have kind of just like you know, we have domesticated cows to be as extractable for their milk. So we have now not just regular cows, but the kind of cows that have bigger udders to give us even more milk. We have turned ourselves into a species that's even more extractable for the resources of our attention and to make us even more manipulatable. So we're more easily addicted, distracted, polarized, disinformed, et cetera. And we've become that. But I think the distinction is the technology companies would claim we're holding up a mirror to society, right? Like, that's your racism in society. That's your conspiracy theorists in society. That's your, um, you know, uh, suffering mental health, anxious teenagers in society. We're really sorry to point the mirror back at you, but that's really your responsibility. And the key thing is that this, they are pointing a mirror back at society, but it's a funhouse mirror. And it's a warped mirror that amplifies very specific aspects of what it pulls back. So it shows us the most narcissistic people. It shows us the most outraged people, because those are the ones that get the most attention. It shows us the conspiracy theorists, the, you know, create the, what we call crazy town in the attention economy. It, it reflects back that specific warped image of society on a feedback loop. And so each time it shows us, no matter where we start, the worst version of ourselves, then we start acting based on that worst version. Then it reflects back of that worst version, an even more worse version. And that's the trap that we're into. Now, do I think Facebook or YouTube ever intended for any of this to happen? You know, when a teenager, a teenage girl shows up on YouTube at two years ago and she watches a dieting video, what did YouTube recommend on the right-hand side? Um, thin, thin inspiration videos or anorexia videos? You know, because those were better at keeping that teen girl's attention based on the model that they have of what tends to keep people like that. Does anyone at YouTube, did they intend for that to happen? Absolutely not. No one wanted that to happen. And when, you know, the advocacy uh, folks in my community sort of uh, raise their hand and say, hey, there's this problem happening. YouTube will take the whack-a-mole stick and they'll try to whack the thin inspiration problem. And just as they whacked the flat earth conspiracy sort of dark corners of certain aspects of the internet. The problem is it is a infinite whack-a-mole game because how many people at YouTube, um, you know, in the 80 elections that are going to happen around the world this year, and in the hundreds of languages in which those elections are going to happen, do you think YouTube has a whack-a-mole stick for those same problems in Burma and Myanmar and, um, you know, excuse me, those are the same countries, um, in um, Indonesia and in, in India, you know, et cetera? No, they don't. And that's what we're seeing is just like climate change, the global South gets the worst of it because you have the least content moderation and the least attention paid by a handful of engineers in California. 70% of Facebook users are actually outside um, the, uh, the United States, which means that their, you know, their perceptions are going to be they're going to be wrong about the assumptions that they're making about other countries 70 at least 70 percent of the time so just to go back to your question you know we we actually want to partner with the people who are inside the tech companies to do as much of the good as they possibly can i would just say that at every moment we've had to pull them for farther than they want to go because there isn't unless there's outside pressure it's just not going to happen it's just like trying to get exxon to voluntarily change its dna from being in oil and fuel Gasoline. As I kind of understand it, and correct me if I'm wrong here, that, that part of what the heart of what, what's happening is that the, the tech companies are, are, because they're ad-based, they're incentivized to keep you on there as long as possible. So the algorithms are written to give you whatever it is, not based on quality, not based on truth, not based on relevance, but they'll give you whatever it is, conspiracy, whatever it is that they know will engage, will increase engagement because engagement creates increase time on the site and the time on the site increases ad revenue. Is that, right. is that the kind of 
are we getting closer to kind of the heart is that that, that algorithm that, is, that has been created to take your time, which mm -hmm. then equals revenue. Money. Um, that's the, if we, we, that's where the tweak needs to happen. If something's going to happen, that's truly going to be a, a better service to humans. Am I, am I close? That's to right. That? That's 100% right. And so long as that's true, even if you got rid of Facebook today, you'd have a hundred other companies rush in with the exact same model doing it even worse. And one example, um, and I'm sorry, by the way, I, I wanna make sure we do, I don't want this to sound just too pessimistic because I'm very good at expressing the harms, but I'm gonna give more examples of the harms, but I don't, I wanna make sure we do talk about optimistically, okay. you know, some of the things that I think are changing and I think we're already hinting at it, but an example of how TikTok, which we didn't talk about that much in the film, but TikTok, comparing to Instagram. So if TikTok comes along, what is their target market? Well, teenagers, right? In the United States and abroad. So they, so who are they competing against? They're competing against other teenagers in the attention economy, specifically Instagram. So what did they do? Well, if you post a video to Instagram and on average, you'd get, let's say a hundred views and you know five likes and maybe one comment that's on average per Instagram video you post, TikTok comes along and says, well, in the race to the bottom of the brainstem, we have to compete at giving you more social validation than Instagram. Mm -hmm. So you post that same video to, to TikTok and they'll give you a hundred X as much uh, views, a hundred X as much likes and a hundred X or five X as much comments, which is quite literally what they did. They actually, we think of it like they're injecting social growth hormone because they're giving us an inflated sense of social approval. They actually gain the algorithm so that if you post a video, they're very good because it's this rapid fire um, scrolling, you know, through on the way TikTok works. They're very good at giving you a view and a like, but they don't actually ever define what a view and a like are. So they kind of inflate the numbers, like credit default swaps. We just inflate the finite, the asset to give us to make it feel good, mm -hmm. um, and that's how they're competing with with Instagram. So that's that race to the bottom of the brainstem for engagement, because more time, the best way to get more time is to hack into more social approval, um, and and so we the the cycle keeps perpetuating, which is why we ultimately need government regulation to to change those incentives so that we're not. Just like we got off the gold standard, we have to get off the engagement standard where more profit and more money can't come directly from more hijacking of the limbic system and the lizard brain. Right. And I'm sure you've heard this a lot, but I would be love to just talk about, you know, I'm sure people have come to you and said, wow, I, I have my own um, business of creating handmade, you know, um, cups or something. I sell them on Instagram. Instagram allows me to live in the country rurally and sell my products or I make yeah. designer clothes or I make, I make things by myself. Right. And I need a marketplace and Instagram and Twitter and YouTube are, are my places to sell my goods. Yeah. So they, they've made it so that I don't have to commute to the city for two hours. I can be home with my kids more. So I'm sure you've heard these stories, right? Mm -hmm. And so how do you talking about some of the benefits, right? That those mm -hmm. seem like totally. really good benefits. <laughs> um, so could you share a little bit about how you see some of the good things that we might want to keep? Yeah. Um, um, so I'll make those points even stronger for, for Facebook's argument. Um, so in a COVID recession and the economy is going down, what's the fastest way to reboot the economy? With micro-targeted advertising. So small, medium-sized businesses can reach exactly the, the you know, consumers and customers that they want, and they can do that by targeting them. In other words, the way we reboot the economy and small, medium-sized businesses is we use more Facebook advertising. So now I'm making their argument for them. I think what this speaks to is the fact that they have become so intertwined. What you're talking about um, is evidence of the fact that they are infused with the very infrastructure of what it means to be a small business. Mm -hmm. You can't be a small business now, seemingly, and reach the people that you've now, you've gotten to a certain growth rate in terms of customers buying your stuff without using these tools. Mm -hmm. Just like our democracy and our public conversations are seemingly infused with this, just like teenagers in high schools are now in social status in high schools are infused with TikTok. And what makes this system inhumane is the fact that we are forced to use infrastructure that is contaminated or toxic that's not good for us or our social health or our civic health, but that we don't have another place to go. So that's just to say, it's further evidence of the fact that yes, these positive things are happening, but it's private profit, public harm. So the only way that this benefit occurs to, for these small businesses is while also harming a generation of kids, while also dosing everybody with conspiracy theories, while also eroding the fabric and life support systems of democracy. So I think that's the, the challenge is, can we make these systems in a way that's not about um, incentivizing the mass zombification of human beings and commodifying us into the whale and the tree that's worth more if we're sort of spiritually more dead than alive?
And it seems like one of the friction points that I hear from the companies is we have to make money, right? And mm-hmm. so we, we want this freely accessible to everybody. So we don't want to have to charge $10 a month for Facebook or Twitter or YouTube, whatever. We want to have it freely available. And so in order for us to have it freely available, we have to have ads. Like we're, we're, we're kind of stuck. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, if we start charging, so what are our alternatives here, right? Because either we charge people and some people can't afford that or we do ads like um, what, what, show me another path forward, you know? And I, I, I know that you have an answer to that, but I do feel like there is a, re- that's the response I sometimes hear is we're ad-based, choose us to use us or don't choose to use us. Um, it's free and this is kind of how we roll. So the first, on the last point you made about choose us or don't choose us, I think that's the problem is that's not a real thing, right? Because we are forced to use these platforms if you're, um, in high school and um, teachers might use Instagram or um, Facebook groups to distribute homework assignments. So you sort of have to use Instagram, right? The other aspect of why we're forced to use these things just to name, um, so going dark for a moment, but the, the Myanmar Rohingya minority group, um, the Muslim minority group in Myanmar uh, who were murdered um, because of fake news that was spread on Facebook, they didn't have to be on Facebook to be affected by Facebook. Yeah. The Indians that were lynched um, because of fake news that were that was spread on WhatsApp um, uh, because of the the viral sharing on WhatsApp, they didn't have to be on Facebook to be lynched because of that. Um, so it's very much reveals the inter- interdependent nature of how we are all infused with uh, these platforms and depend and will will be affected by those consequences. Just like if every single person at Wisdom 2.0 didn't use Facebook and YouTube, we still live in, in this country or in whatever countries you're at where everybody else does and they're gonna vote based on that, that, that aspect. So just to sort of imp- make sure we're framing the kind of interdependent context that we're now living in. Now to your question about the business model. Um, so first of all, these are the, as we say in the film, Shoshana Zuboff who wrote the book Surveillance Capitalism, these are some of the most profitable corporations in human history um, and the amount of wealth that they have, were we to switch to a mandatory subscription-based business model, where just like during COVID, um, I think Comcast and AT&T and PG&E are forced to make sure there's access to basic utilities because they're essentially an essential service. We could have a subscription-based business model that also subsidizes the lowest, uh, those with the least access in society. Um, The key point about going to a subscription business model is to make those thousands of engineers on the other side of the screen see us as the customer and not as the product, where they're working for how do they compete to enable the better fulfillment and and sort of livelihood of of all of us? Because I would want those thousands of people competing on the other side of the screen to enable a more rich life for for all of us. And that's that's the kind of technology that we want, where the incentives are aligned. And that's the key thing we have to change is going from seeing us as the product uh, to us as the uh, the customer and society as the customer. Um, Yeah. And I'm, so, I'm, I'm curious, um, and I know that there's a lot going on, so I don't expect you to necessarily have an answer for this, because I know you've committed the last so many years of your life to really just getting out. Here's what needs to change. Here's, mm-hmm. here's how this system works. We need to all understand how this system works so that we're mm-hmm. not just in the Truman Show, but we're seeing ourselves the larger- Self-aware. Um, we're Truman who climbs up the ladder to open the door yeah, and see yeah. inside and say, oh, this is what's happened to us, yeah. Yeah, and, and as a next step, how do you see, do you see, where do we go? How all people who are watching this and they're like, okay, Tristan, I'm with you. This makes a lot of sense to me. Um, I know there's things like deleting, you know, social media from your phones. There's things like, you know, not sleeping with your phone. There's, there's kind of like some basic things, right? That we can all do to live more mindfully with our, with our technology. Um, do you have a call to action at this moment, or do you feel like the discussion and the conversations that we're having is part of that call to action, or how do you see that happening right now? Yeah, first of all, I just want to say, um, gosh, do I feel uh, that I wish we had done more to be able to receive what was a massively unexpected amount of, you know, just off the charts viewership because we we thought this was going to grow over six months we were putting together some plans of how we might receive everyone and then this just exploded in the beginning and it still continues to explode you know we're now four weeks out from it um but yeah i mean what what can people do the first thing is um 
this is like the climate change of culture and like climate change, it's going to take all of us to address it. Meaning we need a mass collective movement and that movement's going to come from the people, like a cultural enlightenment where the political movement that passes laws and regulation that advocates for that are the people who see the film, the 30 million plus, probably 50 million plus people around the world who see the film, who say, this is an existential threat to degrading the life support systems of, of society. And we are collectively going to advocate for that change. Now, we as Center for Humane Technology are a nonprofit with six people in San Francisco. We didn't expect to become a mass mobilization organization. And there's many other groups we're now partnering with, Algorithmic Justice League, um, Change the Terms Coalition, the Stop Paid for Profit Advertiser Boycott. This is going to take a full court press. If you're not familiar with Stop Paid for Profit, it was a boycott done by, I think, something like 1,500 um, of the biggest brands and advertisers suspending advertising from Facebook for the month of July to um, create, to send a message that dropped the stock price by 8% and said, we, you need to change all these business practices. So there's a whole bunch of these kinds of initiatives. We needed institutional investors to change what they're doing. We need the, the next generation of venture capital to fund humane uh, companies that have a different growth expectations, more like the Zebras Unite model. We need media that are covering the systemic issues. We need a whole generation of high schools and colleges that are self-aware. We need university students and computer science students who don't want to work for the extractive tech companies and actually want to start new ones that are that are that are different. And actually, when they go interview with the extractive tech companies of Facebook and Google, that they say, "Hey, what are you doing to change your business model?" So that those companies hear that message loud and hear clear. So it's a systemic change over time. Um, David J, who's in the chat right now is our head of mobilization. And I was going to mention our next thing, which is that we're hosting a series of conversations that I think are really important to get people into. So you were saying, Soren, you know, how do we change this? I know people are having a conversation. You know, here, here's one message. In the film, the VP of growth at Facebook says, how did we get you hooked to Facebook? It was very easy. You know what it was? All we had to do was get you to seven friends in 10 days. If we got you to those first seven friends in 10 days, we had you hooked for life. So how can you um, sort of fight back? If everybody who saw the film got seven friends in 10 days to see the film who wouldn't have seen the film, the Netflix film, and host a conversation and discussion about it. Um, quite literally last week, I heard um, from several people that instead of spending 90 minutes watching the presidential debates, which I think we can all see was a sort of a race to the bottom of the brainstem shouting match, you know, just a disaster, a much better use of 90 minutes if you care about democracy in this country is to watch the, in the 90 minutes of the social dilemma film and which actually brought family members together who had lost common ground because I think the film um, actually creates a new common ground that reveals the breakdown of common ground. So we can see that lack of common ground together. Um, and that is a critical piece that we're seeing is getting everyone to see the film and have a conversation. And we have discussion guides on our website that I'm sure, and people are saying you know, um, uh, in the chat that they're having conversations with their kids. We're hearing just loads of stories like that, getting schools to, um, to see the film, getting um, high schools. Last step is educate yourself. We have a podcast called um, Your Undivided Attention, um, where we actually dig much deeper into these topics with many of the interview subjects that are in the film. And then lastly, it's very specific and personal is we have a take control page that uh, I'm not trying to market. It was actually due to a failure. We didn't have enough up on the website, but we did put up a new page that gives people a much broader set of like humane actions, humane ways to live in an inhumane internet. And actually I'd love to co-create more of that with this community because I think this community knows a lot about how when there's conflict or escalation emerging, how do we show up in a more compassionate and humane way, even when we, we only see that profile photo and we're commenting on that thread and all of our instincts say, no, that's wrong. I got to go beat up that guy and tell him he's wrong. I think, how do we not do that? What is the new humane way to live on inhumane platforms that reward us doing that, that make money from us doing that? So those are the things that I think I'd love to see people doing. And I really recommend they connect with David Jay and participate in some of these conversations. I know I've gone on for a long time. Whatever. No, no, no. It's great. Great answer. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we're going to bring in a few people. I hope this works uh, just from the audience. We have not, uh, we have not um, figured out, we don't have no idea what people are going to ask, but we have some people with their hands raised. So let's um, bring them in and see. So Diane, oops, let's see. Oh, Jamie. Jamie, are you with us, Jamie? And I'm, I, I unmuted your mic. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much for, for being here with us, Tristan, and, and for answering my question. Um, I'm just curious, um, what, how do you see us developing a strategy to keep the focus here? Um, because part of this attention economy is um, the quick cycles of the, new, of the news, right? And, and something will come up, cause outrage, and be forgotten about. Um, I mean, we have the hysterectomies 
happening in the ICE detention facilities. News for that broke two weeks ago, and it seems like it's it's been forgotten. And so how, how are we going to keep this um, energy around disengagement um, in the attention economy? Thank you. That is just such a great question. I mean, I think the whole premise of the film is what is worth our attention and is the systems that are guiding where we have all collectively spent our attention the last two weeks. If you reviewed that timeline of everything that made up and constituted our collective psyche, where we were, what we were concerned, what we were outraged about, you know, how much of it was a sort of momentary election news and Trump did have COVID then didn't have COVID versus, Hey, look at what's happening with ice and detention centers. Hey, you know, look, there's actually this investigation with the FBI that just came out. Uh, you know, there's so many different things that are going on. And I think one challenge for us is we've actually never negotiated as a society. What does it mean to have technology platforms that create a global collective psyche that is, that is representing what is worth our attention at a global level. I actually think we need to focus a lot more on local, um, local news and local agency, because one thing that makes us powerless is to be constantly presented with information that is beyond the sphere of our own circle of agency. And I think that each of us would do better to marry or couple our information environment with our agency environment. Where do we have actual agency over? Because then if you focus on that and you don't just use, don't use these services for sense-making, you know, focus on what's really important, what's worth our attention, and then bring people into groups to say, how are we going to keep that agenda going and focus on that? Um, and I think that's what we have to do. I don't think we're very good at it. I think we need to learn how to do it. I think there could be opportunities for the Wisdom 2.0 community to, to, uh, to focus on that. I see someone also saying focusing on the positive news, because that's one of the other aspects is that the attention economy rewards negativity and bias. It sticks with us longer. It hangs around our nervous system. It's more, you know, more sticky. Um, and we need, um, uh, I think we need to reward the progress that we're making um, and celebrate the progress that we're making. Because even I, with that one negative comment about the film or something, I will hang on to that instead of focusing on just how much positive impact that this is happening. So it really happens to all of us. And I think that's what we need to do. Thanks, Jamie. All right, so Diane, I think I got you now. Uh, let's see, you're asking to unmute. There it goes. Hello, can you hear me? Yep. You're with us now, yes. Thank you. Good to see you, Soren. I don't know if you remember me, but been at Wisdom too. I do, yes. In, in various ways. So thank you so much for this opportunity. And um, uh, wow, I had so many things I wanted to ask and then the conversation just kind of takes over. So this piece that I'm playing with uh, has to do with that beautiful question that you were asking about that reflex. I kind of don't like the use of lizard brain, but we can talk about that later because there's some beautiful things that rest deeper than this intellect, this new brain that we think uh, should take over. The sense of the embodied sense of things. So here mm -hmm. in this community, we know uh, so much about uh, the use of body in mindfulness. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what we could do technologically speaking, but that moment, if you read something and it's a one-liner and there is that reaction. Basically, it's a threat that's come in. And now I've geared up and I need to do something I think is what you're speaking to. Uh, what could we do to deepen that? I don't know in the tech world. I know in my world teaching about somatic intelligence of pausing uh, where this becomes a cultural shift. I'm not talking about everybody sitting around meditating. I'm just talking about the pause that begins to see it and to see that it's limited and where is the source coming from and what's actually happening with my own system. Mm -hmm. So here we are, we're this system within these other systems and there's this chain reaction. I don't have any answers. I'm just happy the conversation is happening. It'd be great, you know, it's like something flashes on my forehead that says, you know, your battery's running low, you need to plug in. Yeah. Uh, since we honor our, our, our phone. So I'll stop. I'll leave it at that. Thank you so much. Really appreciate this. It's a great point you're making. And, and I think um, the um, Twitter just launched something recently. And by the way, I'm not a techno solutionist believing that we solve these problems with technology. I just want to name that first, but there are um, Twitter introduced a feature before you share. It asks you if it notices that you have not actually clicked the link. Are you sure you want to share it before reading it? Um, and sort of creating a moment of pause or a circuit breaker that slows down the sharing rates of information that people that they've not themselves 
consumed. Um, you know, one of the other aspects you're talking about the somatic element is our friend Linda Stone, who's in the Wisdom 2.0 community, um, who did her work on continuous partial attention. And the fact that we actually stop breathing, she coined a term called email apnea. We stop breathing when we read our email. Um, I think we stop breathing all sorts of times when we're caught in a scrolling loop, right? I mean, are we breathing and somatically grounded when we're scrolling like this and our esophagus is compressed at 50, 45 degrees? Um, so I think that we need to have an awareness of that and we need, it would be nice if there was ways that the technology helped us remind ourselves of that. One simple example of this that I've seen is there's these GIFs that just, you know, the GIF, the animated uh, images, there's a GIF that has a thing that just, you know, expands out and says, hold breath, you know, one, two, three, four, five, you know, then one, two, three, four, and then it goes one, two, three, four, five. And if you just saw one of those in your feed as you were scrolling every 10 moments or something like that, we, we did this experiment with Center for Humane Technology where we, you know, have a social media account. We don't use it the normal way. And all we posted was, are you sure you mean to be here right now? So you'd be scrolling and then you'd see our post saying like, just a reminder to put this thing down in case you forgot. And it's amazing. We got the just crazy number of positive responses saying, thank you, I had totally fallen asleep. And I think these tiny little nudges, you know, could be helpful, but I, I don't want to assume that's the solution. I think we need technology that's not built on trillions of dollars of sucking us in that way and making us forget our bodies and making us forget our breath. Cause that's the asymmetry of power that we're up against. Thank you. Yeah, uh, Eckhart Tolle at one of our events, Tristan was somewhat jokingly said he sends people text messages and the text messages is um, bracket and then the space bar 10 times and then bracket. Yeah. <laughs> empty space to remember. And by the way, as, as we come up with those kinds of practices, I would love to see that get co-created and we can put it on things like a common, what's a humane way to live on platforms that are not designed to be humane to us. Um, and I'd love to co-create that with this community because I think this community knows like, here are those practices to show up compassionately when everything is against that. Here's the way to show up in a grounded way in your body when that's not possible when you're scrolling for 10 minutes. So that'd be great to, to co-create. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, Sophia, I just saw you and then, then I just lost you. Let me see if I can find you again. There's so many questions and sorry, we can't get to everybody. Uh, sorry, one sec. There Hi. you are, Sophia. I see you. I, I, again. I tried to Good get you earlier, but we can hear you now loud and clear. Welcome. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Tristan, for being here. First time I saw the movie uh, was because my friends recommended to me. Um, I don't have kids but I work with kids and I work with parents and I see the addiction to the phone. I have some rules in my house of putting the phone away when we eat or putting away the, food, the phone away when we sleep, things like that. We depend a lot on the phone. It's our calendar, our alarm. Anyways, um, I wanna call the attention on that too. It's not only the platforms, is the apparatus that we are addicted to. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if that makes sense. When I watched the movie, the first thing that crossed to my mind was this seems like a manipulation of the manipulation. Mm. <laughs> but I, I, I can see your eyes, I can see your heart, and I know you are trying to tell us, hey, there is an atomic bomb here we created and we don't want to detonate it more. Mm -hmm. So I appreciate that, but it feels like there is manipulation in this manipulation. So mm -hmm. we use a term in Vedanta called Viveka, discernment. Mm -hmm. So what is the really discernment we all have to be aware of to, in order to engage on a positive way and take advantage of technology that allow us to get in touch with people in the Amazon rainforest. Mm -hmm. We're in San Diego mm -hmm. or in the deepest part of the jungle in Africa when we are in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. So if this is the reflection of the human beings, of course the change has to come from us, but not everybody's willing to do that. Mm -hmm. So how can we make this and an agreement for this. Thank you, Sophia. That's, thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, do you see the Tristan, yeah, that, do you see that what you were all doing has manipulative parts or, or do you see it as trying to see clearly or I'm... Well, I think, I think what Sophia's, I think bringing up is uh, the film is constructed in a way that taps into fear and taps into um, 
you know, the ominous music, or is that what you're talking about, Sophia, or is it, or is it the technologists used manipulative patterns in the way they designed the products, which was it? Oh, uh, sorry, she's, yeah, she's muted, but. Um, uh, I'm gonna ask you to unmute, but it sounds like both. Both. Yeah, both. Well, so, so on the, again, on the film side, um, I, I think that, so again, I didn't construct the film and the directors made their own choices. And, you know, I, I, I agree. I think that there's some, that's a critique of, that's made of the film is it's using ominous, scary type, you know, horror film music or whatever as a backdrop. However, I think, um, and I'm not defending because I didn't make those creative choices, but I think that people really haven't seen the scope and scale and really have it sink in what is going on here. Because like you said, I do personally, I very much have felt for the last five or so years that we have unleashed the kind of equivalent of a cultural atomic bomb and that we have actually perpet we allowed it to keep going. And unlike the atomic bomb where we could say, oh my God, look what we created. Let's create the NPL, uh, sorry, non-proliferation treaty, NPT. Uh, and let's do, you know, monitoring of each other's nuclear programs and let's try to contain these technologies and let's have the Bolton of atomic scientists and let's have the doomsday clock and let's, there's all these things that we did, the pugwash movement to, to deal with that exponential technology that was dangerous. We have not done that with this. Nuclear bombs, we have the equivalent of nuclear bombs that are wired up to trillion dollar companies that have to get bigger every year. And that's, that's what's so alarming. And I don't think people understood that. And so we've been trying to really get people to understand that. Now, I think when I speak personally, I try not to use anything that is of exaggeration, and even the critiques of the film as being, you know, these three AI characters who are twisting their mustache and saying, "Well, let's manipulate him with the ex-girlfriend photo." Um, people think that's actually over the top, but but there's actually aspects of that that are true and real. I mean, the TikTok example, they, they don't hire child developmental psychologists, and they actually thought about, hey, what if we could give you inflated amounts of social approval? And we don't, when you see the heart there, you think it means the number of likes that you got, but they don't actually say likes. So it's ambiguous. They can make the number up and they can inflate the number and they are manipulating us. And so I don't think people understand that kind of, that kind of issue. Um, I do think that we need to find a more optimistic way to relate to all of this. And that's part of what the movement building work and what David J and these, these conversations are about. So as you, you know, as folks here, if they participate in that, I think that I hope that's the tone that it takes. Thank you so much. Um, I think we should do just a couple more if people- Yeah, all right. I was just going to check in with you. Um, and again, sorry, people. I just see your faces and names. And so I, I, I apologize. I tried to do enough men and women, but apologies if you've been here and I'm not seeing you or something. So uh, I'll just grab who I see first. Uh, and again, apologies if that's not you. I see Suzanne. Um, you are Suzanne Reynolds. You are with us and you are, uh, I've asked you to unmute. So you should get a sign. You're yep. unmuted. Welcome. Well, welcome. Hi, Tristan. Um, Hi. We've chatted it many different times when I've asked you about college students and teenagers. And I also put in the chat for the Look Up Youth for Youth Summit we're hosting with The Social Dilemma. But I, um, I've been asked this question a lot of university students, right, who are computer science, design ethicists, UX, UI design. The, the goal, right, is the job at Facebook, Instagram, Google, I mean, and so they're juggling this ethical question on how do I contribute to the ethical design, but I, I need a job and I, you know, need to advance my career and, you know, I got offered a job at Facebook. Um, what is, what is the suggestion for them in this crossfire right now, particularly given the pandemic and the economic situation? Do you have yeah. advice for them? Um, yeah, so first of all, uh, great question. And people should check out lookup.live, your, your event. Um, one of the things is to say really important about what you're doing. Um, I think we need a youth-led movement um, from the youth speaking for themselves about these, these harms and who's, who's going to stand up and be the Greta Thunberg of, of this issue um, because it shouldn't be us and uh, there should be a whole bunch of diverse communities that, that are you know, advocating for themselves. So I'm just excited about what you're doing uh, with, that, with that event that you're hosting. Um, so the reason I think this film was really exciting for me to change those dynamics that you're talking about is you said there's no other place to work, um, especially if you go look at the Bay Area. So this, that's right. an extreme statement. There's plenty of other places to work. But if you look in the Bay Area, the cost of living here is so much, especially once you're on that train track, 
you think you're going to go send your kids to, you know, a school that costs one tenth as much and move to, you know, three hours away and commute in? I mean, the, this speaks to the overall extractive nature of our economy, which spews out digital fallout or rather regular fallout of inequality, um, you know, uh, wealth disparity, discrimination, all these other issues. So it's a reflection of all that. Now, what I will say is I think for the first time, this film is reaching even like the grandparents and beyond people who have no connection to these issues. So that grandparent who would have previously said, my granddaughter now works at Facebook in the advertising department and I'm so proud of them. Now this film creates a new cultural context in which it's now really changed the name of what is what feels like a good thing that we socially reward and what things like uh, something we don't socially reward. And I think the film is going to change that. It's changing the venture capital model. There's now a whole bunch of new, um, you know, projects and companies, nonprofits to for profits that are starting. Um, and I'm seeing that for the first time that I've ever seen it working for eight years on these issues. So I'm excited that for the first time there might be some, there might be other economic opportunities in doing that. And as you said, in a pandemic, it's also incredibly hard. This is just the reality that we find ourselves. Yeah. Thank Just that so I also have to tell you that um, among our youth leaders, our team council, you're the rock star. <laughs> awesome. you no, know you are. You're like the celebrity, <laughs> which is really exciting. Yeah, well, it's good to hear that. <laughs> You'll play whatever role you need to play, right? I'll play whatever role we. <laughs> All right. Um, let's see. Maria, uh, you are with us now, and you're, you're live. I'm asking you to unmute. Oh, you're ready. Welcome. Hi, Justin. Hi, Lauren. Hey, Thank you so much. Um, I feel really passionate about hosting more conversations with people and teaching them from a personal level how to interact responsibly. I know there's a lot to do from the company's perspective and organizations, but what are some books or resources when you mention knowing how we work? and the race mm -hmm. to the bottom of the brainstem, what are the like top three resources that we can be reading ourselves and getting other people to read to better understand ourselves? Um, great to see you. Uh, yeah, it's, a, it's a good question. Um, I wish there were more books that, that I knew about. Um, gosh, there, there, are, there are good books on this. I mean, there, what's the, uh, Jenny O'Dell's work, How to Survive the Attention Economy. Um, I forgot the name um, uh, of her book. Um, right now, I mean, I can recommend our podcast because I think that really does elevate the awareness of the distortion. One, one thing that's really important to us is we think of this like, and I think this community will appreciate this especially, um, that technology is putting on this pair of glasses that causes us to see reality in this very warped way. It causes us to see ourselves in a warped way. It causes us to see our relationships in a warped way. It causes us to see our society in a warped way. And what we're trying to do is say, hey, we've been wearing those glasses for something like 10 years. So we are 10 years into this warping process. So when we want to rewind the clock, we want to become kind of like a spiritual optometrist um, and, and say, well, these are the things, you know, it's like farsighted, nearsighted, like it, objects and mirror are closer than they appear. There's many aspects of this warping that we need to collectively educate ourselves to the to, pull, to take off these glasses to see what has actually occurred. Um, as Esther Perel, I was talking with her earlier this week, she's the uh, relationship uh, therapist, uh, public speaker. And, you know, she has this great line that the quality of our lives is the quality of our relationships. And all you need to know about technology is what does it do to the quality of your relationships? It's like this dimmer. So when you use, you know, social media a lot, it's like, well, it's kind of pretty simple. The quality of our lives is being dimmed because it's dimming the quality of our relationships. I think that understanding is the, is the best thing that we can ship out to lots of people. Um, I do recommend you connect with David Jay and, and others about um, what are other resources? I, I think we have some other things on our website. I have a reading list on my short whale page, I think, um, but it doesn't include things about how to live in this in a more embodied way. And I think that's especially what this community could be so genius at putting together. So. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, so this has been wonderful, Tristan. Thank you so much. Uh, again, yeah. like a lot, I feel like there's a launch that's happening and I'm excited to see, you know, how it's going to move forward. And um, I really, you know, I feel like there is a, there's the internal and external, which is what I've always loved about your work. Uh, you know, there's people who provide information, but there's also then people who go on their own journey and their own transformational journey, and they also provide information, you know, and I think we look at the greatest leaders of our time. They're leaders that, that both spoke beautiful words, but they also really did the inner work to be mm -hmm. that 
to, to, be, to live in presence, right? To really be the truth, to be in that experience. And so I just really want to, you know, honor all your work, both, both disseminating information, but maybe even more importantly, you know, the own, your own inner work and the own inner journey that you've done. And I've always found you somebody who, when I talk to you and we, we talk and we haven't talked for a while, you always, how are you doing? You know, what's going on in your life? Like you put, I always apologize for not being able to get back to you sooner. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. yeah. But I feel like yeah. that's such a, it's such a gift right? So that we can honor all the work that we're doing and the work might get millions of views, the work might get five views, whatever, but that we're also all together as humans on this planet and we need to care for each other and need to learn from each other. And that's kind of, in some ways, how what I feel is your part of what you bring to my life. And I feel like mm -hmm. what your gift is to the, to the world is partly about technology and it's partly about, listen, we as humans need each other and we need right. to be connected to each other in a real way. And when this doesn't happen, bad things happen and so how yeah. do we how do we come back together to remember our humanity and remember how much we mean to each other um so those are my final words <laughs> but uh, you get their true final words so um so anything else you want to say or add yeah, well for, first i just i really appreciate that soren and like i said i mean i have learned so much one of my favorite favorite moments each year at wisdom 2.0 is we usually get these circles where we'll have like paul hawken and byron katie and jack cornfield we're all talking and it's just like where, what planet do i get to be on that we get to have this conversation with these people who are so wise and uh, uh have learned so much from from them and from the community that you put together and everyone here on this call and i just wanted to say that um you know one thing i think i learned from someone else in this community years and years ago was the statement that you know when you're going through something difficult realizing um you're not alone it's okay, and there's a way out. And for the first time, I just wanna share with people who might feel disempowered when they see the film, that what's invisible that I wish you all could see is my inbox. Because for the first time, and for years, I think Soren, you felt this from me, that I felt like not enough people understood these issues and it really did feel like we were alone, the small number of us working on this. And for the first time, I think that we are definitely not alone because this is the vat, once everyone understands this, this is, you know, one, one statement we say sometimes is that everyone is on team human. They may just not understand it yet or may not get it or notice it yet. Once you see these issues, uh, I think people really understand that we're all on the same team because no one does well in the future that, that unfolds if we keep doing what we're doing. So um, thank you just so much for hosting this. And, and I really love uh, seeing everyone's uh, comments here. And thank you all for continuing to, you know, advocate for these issues and, and hopefully continue sharing the conversation with the film and, and beyond. Wonderful. So thank you all for coming. Um, we, many of you or some of you were with us with John Kabat-Zinn and we would have three months of uh, meditations in the quarantine and how we ended it was we would unmute everybody and you can go onto gallery view and everyone can just wish their, say their blessings or wishes or thank yous or um, goodbyes or hellos. So what I'm going to do now is if you go to gallery view and then um, we will you can unmute yourself. So in about 10 seconds, you can just unmute yourself and we'll just say our goodbyes and our blessings. And um, thank you again so much for coming. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you. 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 Thank